So I add my word of greeting to those you've already heard in Jesus' name. I'm very happy to be with you. I guess that Sue told you that Acts 1A contains the outline going forward of the book of Acts. Did you tell you that? Acts 1 through 7 is the gospel in Jerusalem and in Judea. Acts 8 is the gospel in Samaria. Acts 9 through 28 is the gospel in the uttermost part of the world. So what you have is a projection of the whole book going forward in that one verse. The first class that first semester seminary students at Dallas Seminary would take for about 45 years. I was in the class in 1973, and my son is in the class in about 2007, taught by Dr. Howard Henricks, who was one of the greatest communicators in the United States. He's in heaven now. The first assignment was to make 25 observations on Acts 1A. The second assignment in the next class was to make 25 more observations on Acts 1A. The third assignment in the third class was make 25 more observations on Acts 1A. By this time, I was checking with my local army recruiter. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't sure this seminary was really for me. But believe me, there's a lot there. And, and the more you look at it, the more it unfolds to you. My assignment is to talk about knowing God through our work, two massive subjects. I think some of us have a tendency to compartmentalize our Christian lives. And we even have a tendency to hold certain things back. I know a woman who is probably tithed to the penny since she was about 21 years old. She's also slept with whoever she wanted to. I know other people who would never break outside the bounds of biblical morality, but they would never get it up to 10% either. And I think a woman, I don't want to stereotype according to gender, but maybe this could be a prevalent tendency. A woman might want to give the Lord everything but her family. Her family is like her, her turf. And a man might try to yield up everything to the Lord, but his work. It would be like, Lord, you stand over there, because this is, this is stuff I really know about. And I think that's one reason that Jesus conducted so many clinics on the Sea of Galilee, because m many of the disciples worked there, and they thought they knew what they were doing. And I think they suspected, and we even see this in one of the first encounters in Luke 5, they suspected that they knew more about their job on this lake than the carpenter from Nazareth knew. It's possible to be with Jesus or to expose ourselves to Christian activities and never know Jesus. It's possible not to know Jesus savingly. I was in my mid-40s before I figured out when I got saved. Because I always thought that I was saved as a child, that I wandered from the Lord during my teen years, and I came back to the Lord at age 20. In the fullness of time, I realized that was a false narrative, that I came to the Lord at Acts 20. I, I clung a long time to this idea that I became a Christian as a child because I believed Christian doctrine. I believed that Jesus died for me on the cross. I believed that... Um, he would save me from my sin because I believe that. But there was no resistance before sin, and there was no regret after sin. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just a, a matter of, of affirmation or intellectual assent. It has to be the transformation of a life. Now, you're not saved because your life has changed. Your, cha your life has changed because you're saved. It's only by grace through faith with no reference to works that we are, we're saved. That's the justification. But salvation is a complex of many realities. It's not only justification, which can have no reference to works, 
but it's also regeneration, which means you receive a new nature, and that new nature will show itself. It will show itself in holiness. It will show itself by, by battling sin. But even after we become Christians, we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him better and better and better and better and better, which is why a man who probably knew Jesus better than anyone in the world, even though he didn't meet him during the 33 years of Jesus' biological ministry. That's why a man like Paul could say in Philippians 3.10 that his goal was that I may know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. And the place that we really get to know Jesus is the cross. You start at the cross. And you end at the cross. But we resist the fellowship of suffering, don't we? And we resist death, don't we? But Jesus said, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. Unless a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake shall save it unto the life everlasting. John 12, 24 and 25. So Paul in Philippians 2 talks about how Jesus divested himself of all good things. By the way, the cross is not merely the, the dying to bad things. Greed, um, sexual expression not sanctioned by Holy Scripture, backbiting, gossip, sloth, gluttony. That's just morality. The cross is even the death to things which would be otherwise good. Were they not an impediment to our calling in the kingdom of God? And here's the way we prove that. What did Jesus give up that was bad? Nothing. There wasn't anything bad in his life. So in the cross, he died to good things. He died to being a king, being hailed as the Messiah. He died to being worshipped. He died to being honored. He, he left all that aside. And Philippians 2, 4 through 11 talks about what Jesus laid aside that he might work redemption for us. And in Philippians 3, Paul talks about the things which he once regarded as his assets. And then he came to look upon those assets as liabilities because they were an impediment to knowing Christ. I think by this time uh, in your commitment to this Friday morning group, somebody would have told you that work uh, preceded the fall that work is not a penalty for sin. Adam was given the garden to cultivate before the fall. What, but the fall did something to work. The fall made the ground to resist the efforts of the cultivator so that no longer would the earth yield good things, it would also yield bad things, not just roses, but thorns, not just flowers, but weeds. <clears throat> And by the way, before the fall, the first Adam was given roses without thorns. The second Adam, the God-man, was given thorns without roses. Mm -hmm. So he took the penalty for the fall on his own head on the cross. But work became tedious, it became onerous, and it became futile. Not completely, but partially. Whereas you had no futility or tedium before. The earth did not resist. By the way, I'll throw this in. I haven't said this yet. In the pre-fall world, there was no death. There was only prolific, pulsating, exuberant life. So when God warned Adam in chapter, in Genesis 2, you can eat anything you want, but the day you eat from the fruit of that tree, the Hebrew tenses say, dying, you shall die. Well, what's death? And of course, he communicated that to his wife. What, but what's death? Death only, death was, no, death was unexampled in the universe before the fall. 
The only place death existed was in the warning of God. <clears throat> you and I are born into a completely different world. Death is everywhere. Everybody dies. Everything dies. The only place that life triumphs over death is in the promise of God. And in that pre-fall world, God said death is only localized in one place, in that one fruit that hangs on that one tree. And in the world that we're born into, the gospel says life, resurrection life, life that defeats death is localized in only one place, and that one man hangs from that one tree. Now, the warning was not heeded, and that's why we live in a world of death. And the question is, will the promise be believed? <clears throat> But what, what Jesus is teaching us is he's teaching us how to die. And the point of knowing Christ better, the point of growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is learning and growing in our commitment to the cross, to die with Christ, which spiritually has really already happened, according to Galatians 2 and Galatians 3. For I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2, 20. So that the life I now live, I don't live in the power of the flesh, but in the power of the Son of God who died for me. For you are dead, for you are dead, and, and, and you're seated, you're risen, you're seated with Christ in the heavenly, the heavenly, Colossians 3. And it's realizing that not as a theological formula, but as a practical lived out experience, that's what it means to know Christ. Okay, so how do we get to know Christ? Well, two things. We come close to him. And we do what he says. We come close enough to listen. Oswald Chambers said that Isaiah was so close to the Lord that he could hear God talking to himself. Isaiah 6. So when God says, and, and this is a divine soliloquy, God is talking to himself. Whom shall I send? And as I said, well, here I am, you send me. There were concentric circles of proximity around the Lord Jesus Christ. There were, on the periphery, there were the multitude. Coming further in, there were the 70 who went out on certain evangelistic assignments. Coming further in, there are the 12. Coming further in, there are the three. Who were the three? Peter, James, and John. Why, why do we call them the inner three? What privileges had they that the other nine didn't have? Tell me one. <clears throat> um, they saw the Lord by the Transfiguration. On the mount, they went up on the Mount of the Transfiguration while the other nine stayed down the hill. Okay, who can name one more? I took the easy one. Okay, well, it's, your answer was correct. Only those three went in the death chamber of the little girl. When Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, he took Peter, James, and John to the room where she was laid. Other nuns said that stuff. There's one more. Those three went further with him into the gloom of Gethsemane on the night he was betrayed. <clears throat> Within the three, there was the one. Who was the one? John. Why do we say that he was the one? What exclusive privileges did he have, have that evidently the other two did not take? Put his head right here. He reposed his head on Jesus' breast. He also was the only one who showed up at the cross. So he didn't let the cross repel him from the proximity of Jesus in his dying. Okay, so we come near. Now, here's a question for us. Raise your hand in your heart. You don't have to do it visually, physically. Can you remember a time in your life when you were closer to the Lord than you are this minute. You're coming closer to the Lord or you wouldn't have gotten up and come here this morning. You'd have slept or you would have done something else. So you're making an effort. But can you, can you remember a time when you were closer to the Lord than you are now? Now, if the answer is yes, I've got another question for you. 
Now, I don't know the answer to the first question, but I know the answer to this question. If the answer is yes, here's my second question for you. Who moved? If there was ever a time when you were closer to the Lord than you are right now, who moved away? Did Jesus move away from you, or did you move away from him? The reason I know the answer to that question is because it's in the Bible. It's in James 4. Draw near to the Lord, and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So if there was ever a time you were closer to the Lord than you are right now, he didn't move away from you. And so I'll say it this way. I believe in the sovereignty of God, by the way. And I, and I, I know all those principles, but I'm going to say, so don't fight with me on the possible violation of those principles when I say this. But I will say it. You're as close to the Lord as you want to be. Okay? You're as close to the Lord as you want to be. So the way we grow in our knowledge of Jesus, the way we get to know Jesus better is we come close to him. And then we do what he says. So we come to him where he is. Now, again, I believe in, in sovereignty. And I know that he comes to us. He finds us. We don't find him. But there is a reality of human responsibility, not human sovereignty, not free will, but human responsibility where we respond. And when he comes to us, we, we respond to him and we go to him. The first lesson Jesus teaches is where he is and what he's doing. That's the first lesson he teaches. He's 12 years old. His parents thought they knew where he was. He didn't. They'd been on pilgrimage during the feast day to Jerusalem. The men and women walked together uh, apart. They didn't walk together. His father thought, well, I guess he's with his mama. His mama thought, well, I guess he's with his dad. They stopped to rest after the first day of travel. They find out he's not in either camp. So they go back, and they find him in the temple. And when there's a mild reproof coming from his mother, he says, didn't you know where I would be? Didn't you know what I would be doing? Didn't you know I would be doing my father's business? That's the first lesson he taught. The last lesson he taught in the Gospels, at least, in the Gospel of Matthew, was where he would be. Matthew 19, 20. I'll be with you. Excuse me, Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 20 is... Uh, Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 28, 19 is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. Now, when you go into all the world and make disciples, Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, I will be with you. That's the great consolation. That's the great comfort. So when we come to him and he sends us to do a job, he sends us somewhere else, and, it, and it's like we're going away from him. We're not going away from him. You can't go away from him in, in obedience because if you're being obedient, he goes with you. As a matter of fact, when we come to Jesus, when we encounter Jesus, we only have two choices. We either go away from him or we go out for him. And we go out for him he comes with us. He's behind us, commissioning us. He's beside us, accompanying us. And he's in front of us, awaiting us. Now, in Luke 5, the disciples are at work. They've just fished all night, and they're mending their nets. And by the way, if you don't, if you know, don't know what to do, do something. And I'm sure somewhere in your Christian life you've heard this, that God, uh, that Jesus called disciples while they were doing something else. He called Paul when he was trying to molest and persecute and even kill Christians. In Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus. He called Matthew when he was in his tax office, terrorizing taxpayers. He called these disciples when they were mending their nets. And you've also heard it said it's impossible to steer a drifting boat. I don't know why that's true. 
and I haven't driven a boat in a long, long time. My family did have a house at a lake, and for many years I was in a boat all the time. That was a long time ago, but I always wondered why, you know, there, there's a current, and you're, you're going in a direction, but you've got that, that tiller, and move it, don't do a thing. As long as you're drifting, it won't, it has absolutely no effect on the direction of the boat. I'm sure many of you have had that same experience. I don't know why, but it's got to be under power. It's got to be under sail or the engine's got to be on or it doesn't do a thing. So get moving, do something. And the Lord will call you en route. And so they're mending their nets in Luke 5, the place where they think they know what they're doing. And... Um, Jesus is teaching from the boat, and when he teaches, he, he, he sits down, and he doesn't stop teaching. He, he starts training. The difference between teaching and training is when you invite the people that you're teaching to participate. You can teach on evangelism. That's teaching. Then you say, okay, now we're going out. Now we're going to go find an unbeliever and tell him about Jesus. Isn't that a lot scarier than sitting and listening to somebody talk about doing it? But see, that's training, and training is necessary. So he sends them out to give them an object lesson. He says to Simon, this is Luke 5, 4, Simon, launch out into the deep. Sometimes he sends us to a dangerous place. Sometimes he sends us to a place we've already been and nothing happened. Let down your nets for a catch. And, and Simon humored him. And basically what he's saying is, you don't understand. We've been out there all night. We didn't catch anything. That would be a futile effort. That would be a barren harvest. Fish aren't swimming right now. We can't find them with our nets. But then he embraces a disciple's commitment. He says, nevertheless, at your bidding, I will do it. Now, if you want to grow as a disciple, you, you got to identify places in your life where that's the only reason you do something. It's inexplicable on other terms. It's inexplicable financially. It's inexplicable in terms of your background. It's inexplicable in terms of your goals, your plans, or your gifts, or your time commitments. You do it because you think the Lord wants you to do it. And that's the only explanation you have. And if there's nothing in your life like that, you're not listening to it. He says, nevertheless, just because you asked me, I'll do it. I don't see any other reason. I don't see any other reason to do it. I don't see what good it's going to do. If you ask me to do it, I'll do it. So uh, he launches out. And when he did, they caught more fish than they'd ever caught before. As a matter of fact, the net broke. That net they'd just been mending broke. And not only did the net break, but the boats, not the boat, the boats began to sink from the weight of the fish. They had to enlist their other colleagues out there who were in other boats because their equipment could not accommodate the harvest from the sea. The obedient Christian will always produce more fruit than be consumed locally. The obedient Christian will always become a blessing exporter. See, the blessing is never just for you. I confess to you that uh, Sometimes I don't prepare at all. And you're thinking, we can tell. Um, and sometimes there's tremendous blessing. And I wonder why. And it's like the Lord tells me, well, I didn't do it because you were faithful. Mm -hmm. I did it because the people who came to listen to you were faithful. It wasn't for you. You don't deserve it. Some of us have been exposed to the word of God much of our lives. We have to determine, is the word of God going to pass through us like water through a pipe, through our ears, through our brain, 
through our hands, through our pens, to our notebook without, without, without ever changing our hearts? Is it going to be merely informational or is it going to be transformational? A pipe is, is a very uh, effective conduit to pass water through, but you know what? The pipe doesn't grow. And the pipe doesn't change. If it, is, if it is changed, it's changed negatively. It corrodes over time. So is, is the water of the word of God going to pass through us like water through a pipe or like water through a tree? Because you see, when water passes through a tree, the tree grows. The tree puts forth flowers and leaves and becomes beautiful. The tree bears fruit, which feeds generations. Fruit is excess life. The fruit can't consume, the, the tree can't consume the fruit. Somebody else has got to consume. Well, they couldn't catch all the fish. They certainly couldn't eat all the fish. Somebody else had to come get it. And even then, the boat began to sink. Now, what happens is, um, first of all, he used them. He didn't, he didn't have to use their boats. He didn't have to use their hands. He didn't have to use their nets, but he did. He gave them something that he allowed them to participate. It was a miracle. We can't work miracles, but we can participate in the miracles that Jesus is working if we'll be obedient. Let me put it this way. We can't originate miracles. I know some Christians think they can, but I'm still waiting to see it. At the grave of Lazarus, Jesus said, show me where you laid him. You think maybe the Son of God could have found the tomb on his own? Well, call me a fundamentalist, but I think he could have. He said, roll the stone away. You think maybe the, the one who broke the um, power of death could roll the stone away on his own? Well, call me a religious fanatic, but I think he could have. And then when Lazarus came out of the grave, Jesus said, loose him and let him go. You think maybe Jesus could have cut those grave clothes away himself? I think he could have. But he didn't. He gave them something to do. He allowed them to participate in this business of resurrecting people from the dead. Now, we can't resurrect people from the dead, but we can be used in, in that business. And he, he gave them something to do. Just like he gave the servants at the wedding feast in Cana something to do, something that was onerous, something that was weary, something that was quiet. They needed to pour the water out. They were exhausted. They'd served wine for however many days to these lasted. And they, why on earth are we doing this? 72 gallons of water poured out, dipped out by hand. And yet they were only they were the only ones who knew what really happened because they were servants. By the way, everybody wants to know how to lead. Nobody wants to know how to serve. Jesus said, let the greatest among you become servant of all. And at that first feast, that Jesus presided over, there was no wine. So he had to produce it. At the last feast he presided over in the upper room, there were no servants. So he had to wash everybody's feet. They lived with him for three years and the only thing they missed was the point. There were four things that Jesus was always teaching his disciples. This was teased out in a book called The Training of the Twelve, written by a man who died in the 1870s first study of discipleship in the modern age. The man's name was Alexander Balmain Bruce, A.B. Bruce, a professor at the University of Glasgow. The name of the book was The Training of the Twelve. And Professor Bruce said, not when he was meeting with individuals like Nicodemus or the woman of Samaria, not when he was teaching a multitude like the Sermon on the Mount or the Olivet, Olivet Discourse, when he was training the Twelve, Jesus was always trying to teach in one of four categories, model the Savior, Embrace an eternal perspective, increase your faith, and be a servant. Be a servant. Every one of those applies to success at work. Every one of them, especially servanthood. You know, I've noticed that I've, I've known some rich people. I know two billionaires. 
I've known lots, you know, millionaires are everywhere today because money is so inflated. But um, I've noticed a lot of times people who didn't seem to me to be that bright <laughs> became very rich. And, um, but you know, many people who become rich are servants. They figure out how to serve the market in a certain niche. And they, they run to that niche and they, they serve well and they grow rich. And there are rewards for being a servant. And it may not be riches. And that's not the thing that should attract us. The thing that should attract us would be serving the Lord in the assignment that he appoints. Now, Jesus said, now your job is going to change. Because he said, from now on, you're going to be catching. Now, let me tell you a deep, dark secret that only us scholars know. I know it only because of my profound knowledge of the original languages. Are you ready for this? Fasten your seatbelt. Fish don't want to be caught. That's why you have to catch them. If they wanted to be caught, you wouldn't have to catch them. Deep down in their finny little hearts, no self-respecting fish wants to be netted, gigged, or clubbed, asphyxiated, scaled, filleted, fried, and swallowed. They just don't. There's something in their nature that resists that. And there are a lot of hard cases out there who don't want to talk about Jesus. They don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear it. That's why you got to catch them. And disciples figure out how to catch fish. Why? Because that's what Jesus sent them to do. We don't need to teach people how not to catch fish. All of us know how not to catch fish. We need people who are going to learn how to catch fish, who are doing it, and who teach others how to do it. That's the commission that the Lord gives us. That's what he wants us to do. That's what he wants us to do on our jobs and with our jobs. How many of you know what tent making means in a Christian context? No. Paul didn't get paid to be a missionary. It's great to be in secular work. One reason it's great is because you have credibility. Especially you have credibility with your colleagues. I've, I've been with people who love me and who love Jesus, and I, and, but I know they have contempt for my ignorance of the real world. And they show it. They try not to show it, but they do. So most of the time they show it accidentally, but many times they, they show it on purpose. And they kind of, then they kind of apologize. One of the first great speakers I ever heard was Josh McDowell. This is, I was a student. And Josh McDowell said, assume that you're called a Christian minister. You're going to be a doctor, be a missionary doctor. Assume that you're called to full-time Christian ministry and make God show you, prove to you that you're not. Josh McDowell's position. That was in my early 20s. Through my late 20s and through my 30s, I was probably most influenced by a man who was never trained theologically, who became the greatest expository preacher in English in the 20th century. He was a medical doctor. He preached about a block and a half from Buckingham Palace on a street called Buckingham Gate in a church called Westminster Chapel. And his name was Martin Lloyd-Jones. Martin spelled with a Y, Lloyd-Jones hyphenate. Lloyd-Jones took the opposite position to Josh McDowell. If anybody came to him and wanted to be encouraged to go on in ministry, in formal vocational ministry, Lloyd-Jones would always try to talk them out of it. He took the position of an Orthodox rabbi talking to a Gentile who thought he wanted to become a Jew. He would try very seriously to talk him out of it. The philosophy being, if you can be talked out of it, you better not do it. You should only do it if you can't be talked out of it. And then if he saw a, a perseverance in the candidate over time, he would jump on board and, and help him and begin to open doors. Now, I think the two positions are probably extreme. I know Josh's position is extreme. 
And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. But I'll tell you this, I'm 70 years old, and I'm absolutely convinced the truth is nearer Martha and Lloyd-Jones' position than Josh's position. So you don't ever have to feel guilty that you're not a preacher or a missionary or working in the church. You don't ever have to feel guilty about that. But you do have to give all your work to the Lord, and you need to understand who your true employer is, who your king is. And you need to understand that almost everything Jesus said and did was counterintuitive. What does that mean? It's the opposite of what the world will teach you, and it's the opposite of what your instincts are. When I say almost everything Jesus did was counterintuitive, this example I always get, because once you look at this, then you'll get it. In John 9, Jesus encounters a man born blind. What does he do to help him see? What does he do? What does he do to help the man born blind in John 9 to see? Speak. You all know it. Speak. 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 He speaks, but speaks. No, speak. Oh, he speaks. That's the right answer. What did he spit That's on? Amazing. What did he spit on? The dirt. Yeah. What does he make with his spit in the dirt? Clay. Mud. mud. What does he do with the mud? Puts it in the eye. He rubs it in his eye. Isn't that what you do to help somebody see? <laughs> You see what I mean by counterintuitive? Is that the opposite of our instincts? When God counseled Gideon on how he could win the battle, what did he say you need to do? If you're going to win this battle, you've got to do something. What do you need to do? Yeah, send the army home. Just keep 300. You've got way too many soldiers to win this battle. Is that typical military counsel? Had anybody ever gotten that? Military council in the history of the world? Has anybody ever gotten it since? No, totally counterintuitive. Well, so what does Jesus tell us to do with our wealth that we earn from our work? He tells us to give it away. That's pretty counterintuitive. Isn't it? Not so we can be poor, but so we can gain the true riches. So that we can never lose our riches. Because if we try to keep it, we will lose it. Like our life. You seek to say this life will lose it. This is totally counterintuitive. The Christian life is not hard. The Christian life is impossible. Nobody can do it. Only one person has ever lived the Christian life. That person is Jesus of Nazareth. Only one person can ever live the Christian life again. That person is Jesus of Nazareth. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think that's one of your theme verses for this course. Colossians 1.27. Jesus does something for us at the cross. So he can do something in us at conversion. So he can do us something through us in our commitments, in our living out of the Christian life. If Jesus Alpha, Jesus Omega, Jesus in the middle. Jesus doing it all the time. Now, at the end of the Gospel of John, we have virtually the same scene. And what happens after the resurrection, but before the ascension, is that Peter says, oh, I forgot something. When Jesus came up to Peter after the great catch of fish in Luke 5, Peter says, no, 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 don't come, don't come near me. I tell you the whole key is coming close to Christ, but there's a little catch. He says, no, I'm not worthy to be in your presence. You know what that proves? Even though he's trying to hold Jesus at bay, it proves he's getting to know Jesus. Because you know what? One of the first things that happens when you're getting to know Jesus you begin to measure the moral distance between him and you. And your conclusion is, it's infinite. And I'm not worthy to be in his presence. And sometimes, unremitied by the blood and the cross, there's a deep shame about who I am and what I've done and the choices I've made. When we're in the presence of unfallen holiness and we're humbled to our faces. And that's what happened when Peter was realizing, 
just who this person is, whom he humored and obeyed reluctantly. And you say, we've got some Christian leaders today, leaders, media stars, celebrity Christians, who would have walked up to Jesus after that great harvest of fish. They would put their arm around him, they'd slap him in the chin and said, we're going to make a great team, you and I. We're going to bust records all over this load. You just tell us where to go, we'll go catch the fish. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. There are millions to be made in Jesus' name. Christianity began as a group of wholly devoted followers of Jesus of Nazareth in Palestine committed to the death. The faith spread to Greece where it became a philosophy. The faith spread to Rome where it became an institution. The faith spread to Europe where it became a culture. And the faith spread to North America where it became a business. Hmm. So, at the end of John, Peter says, I'm going fishing. Now, if you say I'm going fishing, that probably means I'm going to have a little holiday. But when a professional fisherman says, I'm going fishing, it means I'm going back to work. We can't just sit around here all day remem remembering our times with Jesus. We got, we got to go to work. And they fish all night. And guess what they catch? They catch nothing. And there's a stranger standing on the shore at dawn. And he asks that question that's so embarrassing. Caught anything? Well, why don't you drop the net on the other side? See, some things never change. You tell them, tell them what to do at their job. And then when the great catch comes in, it's not as great as the first time because you could count these. There were 153 of them. And they caught all, they, they fished all night and caught nothing. And then John says to Peter, it's him. So it's the Lord. There are two things here. There are two proofs that the accounts are true. Number one, Peter had just betrayed him. They have a little prayer meeting about that after they have breakfast. By the way, where did he get breakfast? What was for breakfast? Fish. Where did he get the fish? We don't know, but he didn't need them to get them. See, he can do it without us, and many times he does it without us. First time I went to Iraq, I sat in a, in a circle on the floor of 14 men. 11 of them were Muslim background believers. We went around the room telling everybody how we came to know Christ. I thought they were all going to say, well, we came to Christ because some smart, brave guy like you came in here and told us about Jesus. Not one of them said that. Eight of the 11 said, well, I came to Christ because of a vision or a dream. You see, we're scared to go to Muslim countries because they might kill us. So Jesus says, okay, I'll do it myself. And that's what's happening all over the Muslim world. All, all over the Muslim world. He doesn't need us, but he uses us. Where do you get the fish? I don't know. But he originally made the fish. He doesn't need our hands, our nets, our boats to get fish. It's an interesting question to ask him when we get to heaven. Where'd you get those fish anyway? But there are two things here. One was, one was the denial of Peter. See, if the story had been made up, why would that have been put in? Peter had to bear that, bear that stigma and that burden for the rest of his life. That's the first thing people would have known about Peter if they knew the gospel of Jesus. If you're going to make up a story, you're not going to make yourself a goat and a coward and a denier. The other proof is the, the, the fact that Recognition was with, withheld in most of the post-resurrection appearances. Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it's he unless I put my hands in the woods. The two disciples going home on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, they didn't know who he was, so he said the blessing at their table. And the stranger's talking to him, telling him what to do, and it's only after they talk to him and do what he says to do that John says, 
That's him. Now, the Gospels were written last. Probably James was written first. Probably 1 Thessalonians was the first epistle that, that Paul wrote. The Gospels were written last. They'd been preaching in the Greco-Roman world for 30 years, and they, they're they hoping Jesus will come, and they think, well, we better write this stuff down. because Maybe we're going to go to heaven before he comes to earth. And what would they have been challenged on in 30 years of preaching to unbelievers when they start preaching the resurrection? They're going to be asked, are you sure it was he? Are you sure the one who appeared to you that you thought was Jesus is the same one who died on the cross? Now, if they were challenged on that, which they would have been over and over and over, you think they're going to report? You think if they're making up a story, they're going to report, well, we didn't recognize him at first here. We didn't recognize him at first there. We didn't recognize him. No, 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 no. Why did they report that? Because that's what happened. Because it was the truth. They told the truth about the cross. They told the truth about the resurrection. They told the truth about the post-resurrection appearances. And they told the truth about the withheld recognition <clears throat> in his sovereignty. You see, he can't be known according to the flesh. Anymore. He's risen. And then... Here's the reinstatement. There would have been very, there would have been um, every reason for Peter to believe I'm disqualified from ministry. I denied him three times. So three times Jesus asks, Do you love me? He gives him three chances. Peter didn't answer his specific question because he said, Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other disciples? He says, You know I love you. But that's not a question I asked you. But he gives him three opportunities. And then he says, do the ministry. Do the ministry. Do the ministry. What is that? It's an official reinstatement, so everybody will know. I'm not disqualifying them. I could, but I'm not. Well, I jumped on my horse and rode off in a hundred different directions. You go home and tie it up with a blue ribbon. At least you can know the passages that you need to look at. We've been talking about how we know Jesus at work. We come close to him. And we do what he tells us to do. Uh, that can happen at work. Sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it doesn't happen at church. And sometimes it does. I think we can take a few minutes for additions, clarifications, disagreements. It's helpful. Well, thanks. You got to have a question. Did you record this? I did. Thank you. That answers all my questions. That's the only answer I have either. Thank you. <laughs> Zoom, we can hear you. You can ask the question if you want to. So, Ronnie, does it ever get easier? Any easier? The Christian life? Yeah, or doing I'll tell, I'll tell doing you what he says. I'll tell you uh, what I heard Chuck Swindoll say once. The Christian life gets harder and harder and better and better. And um, it's actually good when it gets harder because that means that there's greater resistance. And that means we're a greater threat. The devil never bothers some of us because we never threaten. The two institutions that the enemy attacks the fiercest are the local church and Christian marriage. And the reason is because those are the two institutions that threaten him the most. And the reason they threaten him the most is because if, a, if Christian marriage breaks up, and the two, God, two of the godliest people I knew and I've tried to follow both of them as my official leader in ministry. Got to divorce their wives. One of them had a girlfriend. The other just got mad at her. Two of the biggest shocks in my life. They rank right up there with what happened to Robbie, which may be the biggest shock of all. Um, but you see, when the unbeliever sees that, or when the unbeliever sees churches splitting and bickering Christians, you know, churches breaking up. The unbeliever says, hey, we get along down in our office better than they get along down there in the church. Nobody's saved in our office. 
And I didn't want to preview it with my wife. I mean, we got, still got a little romance going. We've been together 25 years now. We think we can finish it out. And we're not, we're not 40 years. So the double tax pierces that which he, um, that which he which threatens him most. Now, you ask, uh, is it getting easier? It didn't get any easier for David, did it? Because the greatest man in the world committed the greatest sin in the Old Testament. And I'm not, not talking about the adultery. The adultery was bad enough, but it was hot blood. The murder was cold blood. And it wasn't somebody random. It was a devoted friend. Uriah was one of the gadolim, the honor guard, who were most committed to David. And David killed him. That's another reason we know the Bible is true, because the, its heroes are not shielded. We know the worst things about them. And by the way, our greatest test, see, David couldn't serve God on a throne. He, he, he did something terrible, but he served him in a cave. David had the promise of being a king because Samuel anointed him, but David was forced to live in caves because the king whose kingdom he saved hated him and wanted to kill him. So David had to hide in caves from Saul. He had to hide, hide in caves from the Philistines, and he had to hide in caves from his own son. But when he was in the caves, he wrote the Psalms. And when Paul, who was called to be an itinerant missionary, was thrown into prison, he wrote the prison epistles. And when Joseph, who was promised that he'd be exalted over his brothers, but looked up at his brothers who were looking down at him when they threw him in the pit, and he went from the rejection of his brothers to becoming a slave to becoming a prisoner because he was falsely accused, what did he do in prison? He ministered, Genesis 40. He ministered to the baker and to the cupbearer. And what did he say to them? He said, the interpretation of dreams are from God. Now, where did he get that? He didn't get it from his experience. Because the opposite of what God showed him in the dream had happened in his life. The opposite, so far, that that wasn't the end of the story. So faith comes in when you believe this isn't the end of the story. God's promises will be vindicated. And when Paul knew that they were called across the Aegean from east to west when they went to Macedonia, a very short time later in Acts 16, they were in a Philippian jail. And they weren't just in the jail, they were in the inner prison. They weren't just in the inner prison. Their hands and their feet were in bonds, which means they couldn't go to the bathroom. It didn't matter because there wasn't a bathroom. So what do you do when God, call, you know you're where God wants you to be, and you can't even attend to your own hygiene? Well, Paul and Silas worshiped and sang hymns. David wrote songs. Earthquake came and they stayed. Yeah, and that's the key to missions right there. We're way off the subject now. Now we're going to talk about my work. The key to missions, you will understand the key to missions if you will understand why Paul and Silas didn't run out of that prison and God sent an earthquake to open the doors. And the reason, I can't talk about that, get emotional. The reason is because they were already free. Yes. It was the jailer who was in prison. And they knew their life was to save his life, not to save their life. Jesus died because his job wasn't to save his life. His job was to save the life of others. And he couldn't do that without dying. So one more question. Way off the subject. So, more, so how are we accountants and financial people and digital marketers and real estate professionals any different? Well, you're not any different. And, and again, the Lord will show you what your task is. You know the old story about how the king is walking through the building under construction. And he looks at one mason and he says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm building part of a wall. And he walks over and he, he says to another mason, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a cathedral. And you're, we're all building a cathedral with your jobs. However, and there is no small job as long as it's honest and needed. Few things needed more than clean toilets. 
or swept floors. If your job is sweeping floors or cleaning toilets, do it, do it to the glory of God. Hudson Tether said, a little thing is a little thing. But faithfulness in a little thing is a big thing. And remember, one day things are going to be flipped. The last will be first. Abraham told the man in hell, you know, Lazarus used to feed on the crumbs from your table and and you fared sumptuously. Not like that anymore. And it's never going to be like that. So again, Jesus is not teaching us how to lose everything. He's telling us how to keep everything by giving it to him. You know, what, what, what Jesus required of the rich young ruler, it wasn't a great requirement. It was a great offer. If he said, give all your possessions away or sell your possessions to give the proceeds to the poor, that would have been a great requirement. But that's not what he said. He said that. Then he said, come and follow me. What was he saying? I'll take care of your expenses. Who do you want to keep your expenses? God or your broker? Who do you want to protect? God or your broker? I, I mean, the, the gathering demoniac said, can I go with you? And he said, no. Because a week after you leave, everybody will say it never happened. You're going to be my trophy of grace in this community. You're going to remind everybody, somebody came here representing the God of Abraham who made me clean. Mm -hmm. And you can't deny it. So um, there are no small jobs as long as we have a great employer. as long as we serve the king in his kingdom. But remember, it's all counterintuitive. We get our orders from Jesus. We're not going to figure it out. Our flesh isn't going to tell us the right thing to do. The world isn't going to tell us the right thing to do. And it's going to seem very counterintuitive. Live lives that are mysterious to your neighbors. They might call you a fanatic, but so what? Amy Carmichael was a fanatic. Hudson Tedder was a fanatic. C.T. Studd was a fanatic. Christian life is a journey. Keep walking. It's a battle. Keep fighting. And it's a mystery. Keep asking. 